Thank you for joining us for the afternoon's second and last panel presentation. We have four really interesting presentations here on innovative um, new projects that are very different. Um, and I'll be introducing each one and then Monica Oz will be doing the moderation. But we have um, Audrey Kern from Peer, who's going to talk about their robust CBT training program for substance use disorders, including opioid that we're very familiar with and that has FDA and Medicaid funding approval. Jason Kahn is going to talk to us about the children's cartoon based mental health program, which is very interesting. Brian Cole will talk to us about a web-based suicide assessment system that's backed up by telehealth support that has reached school districts across the U.S. and internationally. And um, Dror Zaid will wrap it up by talking about their system with Elios, which lays an artificial intelligence listening program over clinician therapies to be able to detect whether that they are staying on script in terms of the sequence of things they're supposed to be doing in clinical training or not. And that's kind of a preview for artificial intelligence for the future. So four very different but innovative new programs. So, um, and again, we'll have questions and answers in the Q&A tab if you're interested. So um, first, uh, Dr. Audrey Kern is joining us from Pear Therapeutics. She's currently Global Medical Director at Pear. Um, she serves as an expert in substance use disorders and opioid use disorders. She's board certified by the American Board of Preventative Medicine, the American Board of Addiction Medicine, and M American Board of Emergency Medicine. And uh, she's an active leader and distinguished fellow and currently serves as a Region 3 Director representing New England for the American Society of addiction medicine. So she obviously is going to talk about pair therapeutics, reset and reset O for substance use disorders and opioid addiction. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Audrey Kern. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, this morning, we heard a variety of perspectives on digital health and its role in behavioral health. And as we focus a bit more on specific treatments, I'm happy to start us off by uh, talking about PEARS Therapeutics for Substance Use Disorder and Opioid Use Disorder Reset and Reset O. My disclosure is that I am an employee of PEAR Therapeutics, and uh, this talk has been prepared for this audience. So the idea of software as a medical device and the world of prescription digital therapeutics or PDTs is very new and it's helpful to have a framework with, within which to understand this. Um, if you went to the app store right now, there are literally thousands of health and wellness apps available. So how do health and wellness apps, pharmaceuticals and PDTs differ from each other? Well, uh, health and wellness apps and prescription digital therapeutics both utilize digital technology to improve human health. And pharmaceuticals and PDTs both require testing in randomized clinical trials and FDA, FDA authorization for safety and efficacy. And they can both be reimbursed via either a pharmacy or a medical benefit. In addition, only PDTs provide real-time feedback to clinicians. So if I see a patient in my office and prescribe a medication to them, I might see them back in 30 days. I don't really know what's going on with my patient and their medication over the course of 30 days. But uh, with a PDT, I can look on the clinician dashboard and I can see how my patient is doing uh, with, their, with their therapy. So that's very useful clinically. When we think of the uh, history of therapeutic modalities that we have had available for our patients, now, starting in the 1900s, we had small molecules available, followed by biologics and cell and gene therapies. And now we've had the advent of PDT. So we think of these as the next step in uh, a natural evolution of uh, treatment modalities for our patients. Uh, this morning, we heard a little bit about the FDA authorization process from Paul Jeffrey. Of course, uh, FDA authorization starts with pivotal clinical trials in which the therapy is tested for safety and efficacy. 
and that generates the data that is submitted to the FDA. And from that point, there, there are several pathways. Uh, there's the de novo or pre-market certification pathway or a 510K clearance. But regardless of the pathway, uh, the clinical data must describe a validated model of behavioral therapy for the disorder, and it must validate the behavioral therapy as implemented by the device. Uh, with, within the de novo pathway, devices that are approved through de novo can then be predicates to devices that follow. So for example, uh, pairs reset was FDA authorized in 2017 through the de novo pathway, and that was followed by Reset O, which was authorized in 2018 uh, through the 510K pathway, and then SOMREST for chronic insomnia, authorized in 2020 uh, through the 510K pathway as well. But once the FDA makes its decision, the uh, authorization and review pro process doesn't start stop there because there is ongoing post-market surveillance and the FDA requires monitoring to evaluate uh, continued safety, efficacy, and performance in real world use as well, looking at safety monitoring through record complaints and user feedback, adverse events reporting, as well as literature reviews. PEAR has a robust pipeline. You can see our pipeline here with our three FDA authorized uh, therapeutics at the top. Um, as of November 21, uh, PEAR received FDA breakthrough device designation for the development of a PDT to treat alcohol use disorder. And as well, we have many other uh, indications, neurologic, psychiatric, and other indications as well on our pipeline. So here you can see uh, our two products for substance use disorder and opioid use disorder, RESET and RESET O. They're similar in that they are both F, uh, they are both 12 week courses of treatment that are for patients age 18 years of age or older. Uh, RESET is for patients who have cannabis use disorder, alcohol use disorder, plus another substance, stimulant use disorder such as cocaine or methamphetamine or and or uh, opioid use disorder when it's not the primary substance of use and it's intended to increase abstinence from the substance of use and increase retention in outpatient treatment. Reset O was developed specifically for patients with opioid use disorder and is meant to be prescribed in conjunction with transmucosal buprenorphine and it's uh, intended to increase retention in the outpatient treatment program. So here you can see on the left, the patient facing device as it appears on a smartphone. It could also be uh, delivered on a tablet. And on the right, you can see a, a view of the uh, clinician facing dashboard. Both Reset and Reset-O contain three forms of evidence-based treatment that are combined within the therapeutic. And those are cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically the community reinforcement approach, uh, which is a type of CBT that's been developed for people in recovery. Also fluency training and contingency management. And uh, beside these evidence-based forms of treatment, functionality also includes the ability to have patients record their cravings, their triggers, their substance use. All of the information that patients enter into the device is stored in the device so they can track their progress. And it's also shared with their clinician uh, via the dashboard pretty much in real time. So you can see this isn't a treatment that you give someone and send them out the door and they treat themselves. It's really meant to be used as a bridge between the patient and the clinician during those times when patients can't be seen in the office and for patients who are under the ongoing care of, of a clinician. So of course, um, there, uh, the FDA authorization starts with randomized controlled trials, uh, but that does not, that's not where the evidence ends to support clinical use and policy and decision-making. 
since our launch of Reset and Reset O commercially in 2019, we've had tens of thousands of prescriptions that have generated data that we have used to uh, perform analyses looking at real world evidence that confirms generalizability and external validity of these tools, as well as allowing us to do health economics uh, outcomes uh, evaluations. So let's take a look at uh, some of this data. The pivotal trial for RESET uh, was conducted in an intensive outpatient setting where 399 patients were divided into uh, two patient groups. The treatment as usual group saw their clinician for six half hour sessions per week. And the intervention group saw their clinician for two half hour sessions. And the other sessions were substituted with completing modules on a desktop computer in the clinic. And what we're looking at here in these bar graphs, on the left, we can see the outcomes for abstinence in the last four weeks of the study for these patients with a variety of substance use disorders. Uh, the gray representing those who received treatment as usual and the green representing those who received the intervention. And you can see about a doubling of effect in the last four weeks of the study in regard to abstinence, which is a, a very significant outcome. On the right, this bar graph is looking at a subset of the all patient group. These are people who were not able to be abstinent when the study started. And so they were looked at more specifically because they were considered more refractory to treatment. And within this group, you can see only 3.2% of the treatment as usual patients were able to be abstinent in the last four weeks of the study. Uh, as compared with 16.1% of those who received the intervention. So that's about a five-fold increase. As well, we have our retention data here, 76.2% uh, versus 63.2%. So again, uh, a significant outcome for retention in treatment. The pivotal study for RESET O uh, was conducted in a more of a uh, traditional MAT outpatient setting where treatment as usual consisted of patients seeing their clinician for half an hour every other week. Of these 170 patients enrolled in this study, uh, they were randomized into two groups, but both groups saw their clinicians for half an hour every other week. Both groups received transmucosal buprenorphine and both groups received contingency management rewards. The uh, intervention group also completed modules uh, on a desktop computer, four modules per week. And what we're seeing here in this Kaplan-Meier curve are the results for retention in treatment over the 12-week course of the treatment. And you can see the difference uh, where red represents the intervention group. 82.4% of them completed the 12-week course of study versus 68.4% of those who received treatment as usual. So again, that was a significant outcome for retention in treatment. Now we're turning to some real world uh, data that we have looked at, looking at a group of patients who used Reset O, um, patients who used Reset O for one 12 week prescription are shown here with a green bar and those who repeated the treatment and had a, a re-prescription uh, are shown with the gray bar, so 12 and 24 weeks. And there were 30, about 3,800 patients in the 12-week group and 643 in the 24-week group. And what we're looking at is engagement with the therapeutic over the 12-week course of treatment. And you can see retention is pretty high over all 12 weeks. And here on the 12th week, the outcomes are 55% for those with one uh, prescription and seven, over 75% for those with uh, two prescriptions. So when we compare this to the known retention rates for people who use wellness apps of three to 5%, uh, this is really a very uh, robust outcome. Now we're looking at this same group of patients. Uh, how active are they within the application at, during various times of day? So we're looking at a course of a 24 hour day and I, it's a little hard to appreciate, but there's a gray, uh, gray shading here that represents 
uh, the time of day that are, uh, a, a, tip, a typical clinic hours would be open. And what we can see is that patients are using the app about 60% of the time during those times when clinics might be open, which means the other 40% of the time, they're using the application nights, weekends, holidays, and other times of day uh, when the uh, clinic would not be available to them. Oh, there's our, there's our shaded section right there. We were also able to do uh, several sets of uh, healthcare resource utilization analyses using Health Verity Private Source 20 Claims Database. Uh, in this uh, retrospective analysis of people who had opioid use disorder and used Reset O, we looked at a group of 334 patients during the six months prior to their use of the treatment and then their six months after the use of the treatment in terms of healthcare re resource utilization. And what we found were, was a decrease of 62% in inpatient stays, a decrease of 20% in emergency department visits, and a decrease of 22% in surgical procedures. The category that we saw an increase uh, was case management services, which uh, for people who are uh, recovering from opioid use disorder, a chronic illness, this represents an increased engagement of outpatient services. So that's actually a very desirable outcome in this patient group. And I can see that I'm right up against my time. So I will stop there and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Appreciate that presentation, Audrey, and very, very uh, impressive results. <clears throat> I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is um, Jason Kahn from uh, Mightier. And um, I got to know Jason sometime about a year ago, and they have a really exciting project that is designed to help children uh, manage their behavioral health problems and build emotional strength and uh, be able to harness their emotions to, to uh, uh, overcome behavioral health challenges. Um, Dr. Khan is a chief science officer and co-founder of MyDear. He's also on the staff of Boston Children's Hospital uh, in the Department of Psychiatry and uh, also on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. And uh, he and MyDear have a really interesting approach to this work, and I hope you really enjoy the presentation. So, Jason, you're up. Hi, everyone. And Bruce, thanks for that introduction. It's it's really nice to be here with everyone. And I need to say I'm impressed with the program and the and the people that have been able to present today. And I'm honored to be part of this. So my dear, this is going to be a very different approach than some of the things we've heard about today. And I think maybe even back up. And I just want to start by setting the stage of, of how we think about what my dear is and what we're going to talk about. And so really in three parts. Uh, going to talk about emotional regulation. So this idea of building transdiagnostic uh, strength-based interventions that can help a huge amount of children um, across a spectrum of diagnoses. Going to talk about game-based biofeedback. So one of the things that we do is we put our biofeedback tools inside of games. Uh, we do this because it's fun. And then we can also take this and we can take this and build evidence around this. And I'll talk through that as well. Um, and the piece, and actually I'm going to start here, but the other piece that has been so animating to us has been the idea of access and the idea of how do we change the conversation about how young children receive access to care at a time when we, um, when we know there is so much increased demand. So to start off with, I want to give you guys my dear's view of the pandemic, which is a little different. Um, uh, what we did and what we were able to do is, so like I said, we have a biofeedback-based platform. And that biofeedback-based platform means that we are watching kids' heart rates as they play video games. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw something really strange. We saw kids' heart rates go up. Uh, and not just a little bit. We saw them go up a very noticeable amount, as you can see from this graph. 
And what we felt like we were seeing is we were seeing a hidden story. Um, we knew kids' lives were changing and we knew the major difference was that we were withdrawing all of their social supports and the ability, this biological change, this fingerprint was really the story of stress and to a group of kids who don't have a ton of voice. And so really, how do we, how do we understand and how do we look at this story and how do we respond to this story? Um, and I think we put that in context of, this is not going to surprise anyone in the audience, but what our current approach to access to care really looks like. Um, as like Bruce said, I, I come from the Department of Psychiatry at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm very familiar with that wait list. It is quite long. I'm sure everybody here in this audience has some perspective on what wait times look like for access to mental health care, especially pediatric mental health care. And throughout the pandemic, we know we've been losing providers faster than we can add providers. I believe the statistic is for every 10 people who join the field, we're losing 13. Um, and from the perspective of a family, from the perspective of that one family, that one mom and that one kid who is trying to find a solution, um, they have nothing. They are sent to, they're sent and they're waiting in line and they're waiting in line for months. And so really our take on this as developers of a tool is that we've got to find something that will work anywhere. It's got to work here. So it's got to work in the in your house, on your time, when you need it. And that's really, if we want to be able to really change the conversation about what mental health access looks like, we've got to start and that's got to be our first goal. So that's kind of the, that's kind of my dearest perspective on where we are with the access problem. And now I'm going to talk through how we go about addressing that and what my dear looks like, especially from the perspective of a kid and a family. And so, like I said, we're biofeedback. And I think one of the things I want to emphasize in the context of this presentation is that the digital environment really gives us new ways to build new mechanisms. We don't necessarily only have to rely on all the old mechanisms that have been put in place. And so the way my ear biofeedback works is that you play a video game and you play a video game that has had some previous life um, on the app store. So some other external developer, some third party developer has built something that's fun, that's already demonstrated retention, that's already demonstrated engagement. Um, all of these challenges that exist in building digital products have been um, addressed. My dear adds an emotional learning layer on that and it looks kind of backwards from the adult perspective. So what happens in my dear is, is you're wearing that heart rate monitor, something that looks a little like this, um, it sees, it uses that heart rate monitor to find those moments of frustration that naturally exist inside of video games. And then when those moments of frustration come, the backwards bit is my dear makes the video game harder. And most adults kind of get very worried at this point and they think that kids are going to be very, very challenged by this and very, very alarmed. But what happens is kids are motivated to get better at the video game. Uh, we are in an environment where kids want to succeed, where kids have the language of success and they enjoy success. And so at that moment, my dear scaffolds regulation strategies, uh, regulation strategies like deep breathing or progressive muscle relaxation or crossing the midline. Uh, and it invites the child to take a pause in that moment. They see their heart rate on the screen. They take that pause and then they calm themselves back down. They see their heart rate go down, 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 down. Uh, the difficulty then melts away outside of the video game. And then the child goes on and plays until the next challenge comes. And then another moment of practice comes. And so what we see over the course of my dear play is these hundreds of moments of practice. We call them cool downs inside the game. And as they build, we start to see improvement. I'll talk about our data in a little bit. Um, one last piece on what does the product look like? So this is the child perspective. This is the child window on the product. We also do a lot of work to make sure that we can wrap the product in a way that the entire family can be successful. We know that kids are not acting alone. We know they have an eco ecological context. We know we need to make sure that entire family unit can be successful. So we do member outreach. We have a parent app, which has a whole lot of CBT inspired modules that again are aimed at the parent. Um, we have an expert support team that has you know, clinical social workers on the team too, to make sure that if parents call up with clinical questions, we can support them there. And uh, we take the child then, they take the child and the family through uh, through an onboarding and an unboxing experience um, where they can then use this and then this child can get into the world. And then we support this, we wrap around this, we actually are starting to build activities that are whole family centered. So child and parent can play together. Um, 
One of the nice things about this and one of the nice things about coming from academic medicine is that we've been able to do a lot of work, both uh, looking at real world and now we're starting to look at, we'll start in clinic and now looking at both real world and cost of care data. Um, so this slide right here, this is fun. This blends some of our real world and our clinical data uh, together. So we are able to look as the retention curve looks as to how many parents are reporting improvement over time. And what we see is this level of improvement start. It starts right away, but then it continues to build. That's on the left. But on the right, we've been able to run, we've been able to run clinical trials. And I've, I've summarized them to two findings that I find really important and really front and center, and I think really unique to what we've been able to do at Mightier. So what do we see on the left? Parents reporting less conflict, which was done in a randomized control trial that we did inside of Mightier, and then parents reporting less stress, which we did back at a randomized control trial back at Boston Children's Hospital. And the, the piece here is in both of these trials, we measured symptomatic change. So we measured irritability, we measured aggression, we measured anger, we measured disruptive behaviors uh, through a variety of scales. And we saw clinical trial, we saw a clinical change and we saw a separation between the two groups. But the idea that we can take these symptoms and then see some sort of distal outcome, some sort of systematic outcome that impacts the child's environment is going to reinforce, um, it reinforces the change that we see. And it means that the child is not just building skill inside of a game and they're getting really good at that, that mechanism that I showed you a couple slides back. They're taking that skill. It is building outside of their environment. And we at Mightier, we find these types of measures where we look at not just the clinical change, not just the symptomatic change, not just the performance in the game, but its impact on the child's environment to be front and center and part of everything we do. Uh, We've also, as I go on to the next slide, uh, started looking at treatment for kids with ADHD and especially at a standalone context. So we've started working with insurance companies at Mightier and have been really encouraged by the type of results we've seen. Um, this is being used, this slide is a little bit, like it stacks it up as a comparison, but we can also have done this in an adjunct way too. And I think like one of the things that we're really struck by is that when you look at this, when you get kids in the door, we're not talking about adding a lot of cost, but the type of effect, even just by your standing alone, the type of effects that we see are in the same ballpark as the type of interventions that are already in place. And this continues, this is not just for ADHD, but we've also been working with Magellan Healthcare, who is a health, uh, behavioral health provider and looking at kids with autism as well. Um, this was integrated into ABA treatment and what we saw there was, was was a lot of fun. So we saw, you know, looking at adding $400 to the standard ABA cost of $60,000. I should back up. Um, I'm assuming with this audience that we've seen that we've run into the acronym ABA, but ABA is applied behavioral analysis. It is a standard treatment for children with autism. It is often covered by insurance company. It's often mandated. Uh, so time of diagnosis, this is usually becomes part of the treatment plan for children. And because it requires so much one-on-one -on -one services, it becomes very expensive. And um, across the industry, there is a wide, a wide need to find alternatives. Um, so ABA works, but being able to reduce the amount of burden, both on the family and time, and then in terms of burden on our healthcare system is, is really important. What we see when we add Mightier on top of ABA is that we start seeing clinical inter we start seeing results that are magnified, they're amplified. And you know, this type of change happens relatively fast. This was measured over three months. And that change, I think, really reflects the fact that there are certain, like each of these interventions has a role to play. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we listen to, as I've, I've been listening to some of the other talks, is that really as you start stacking these things up you can start to build the right type of intervention and the right blend of things that are that are right for the child. And as you add more tools in, you have the opportunity to magnify results. We know ABA doesn't focus on emotional regulation, so it makes sense that adding an emotional regulation tool into the mix can be really powerful for some subset of children. Um, gonna wrap up um, with one more slide before I sort of get to the conclusion, but. The other thing that we have going on with Mightier is a large scale cost of care study that we are running with uh, NIMH. And so 
we're doing this also in conjunction with uh, Magellan Healthcare, but able to look at, this study is currently recruiting, but what we're doing with this study is we are splitting kids up into two groups and then not just looking at clinical outcomes, but looking at the trajectory of financial claims as a conjunction of adding a digital intervention into the treatment plan. Uh, as I said, this this is this study is recruiting, and as it goes as it goes on, there I can't talk anymore. As we continue to roll through the study, uh, we're looking forward to reporting results and seeing where this all plays out. We're hopeful that for the field, we can again add to the story that has been shaped uh, from previous uh, from previous speakers that digital interventions, when we add them to the treatment plan, not only do they have clinical significance for our patients and our families and our members but also can help increase the efficiency of our system as a whole. I know there are a lot of fun people and exciting people in the audience today. And I just, I want to wrap up with a thought, which is that we at My Dear, we're a relatively small company. We're relatively new. And so I think that if there are groups in the audience who are interested in what we're talking about and are interested in talking more, uh, we're always open to keeping, we're always open to keeping the conversation going. Um, as you can tell, like this is something that I know that we all care about. It's something that I care about. And just like I said, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about the entirety of the presentations that are happening today. So thank you. Thank you, Jason, for that really interesting presentation. We really appreciate it. And uh, very interesting. <clears throat> I started my career doing biofeedback research at Johns Hopkins and, and with kids, and uh, this really strikes a chord with me. So great stuff. The next speaker is going to talk about something completely different, um, but with tremendous reach. Uh, I'm introducing to you to Brian Cole. Dr. Cole is a 20-year technology professional who has spent his career working with startups and large organizations such as Bose and Dell Technologies. He's been at Riverside for about a year, maybe a little more, and is the executive director of MindWise Innovations, which is a service of Riverside Community Care. Uh, and he leads all the strategic organizational and business direct development uh, efforts of that. And he's going to talk to us about a suicide assessment system that is virtual and um, that is being used throughout the United States and in other countries. It has an enormous reach and is backed up by clinician telepsychiatry and it is uh, already having a powerful impact all over the country and in other countries in the really important um, area of suicide prevention in children and youth. So it's a pleasure to introduce Brian Cole. Brian, take it away. Bruce, thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's been it's been great. What a what a conference thus far. Monica, I wish I wish I could see you. Your comments this morning on digital transformation, specifically around how work gets done, uh, specifically around how to re-engineer the need to re-engineer processes or or how products and services are delivered kind of a recurring theme with what I'm going to talk about. And Trina, your words, your comments on human-centered design, design thinking, um, digital nativism, you know, digital uh, divide, again, recurring themes with what I'm going to touch on. The presentation is entitled Direct to Youth, Evidence-Based Suicide Prevention, and the burgeoning role of technology. I think burgeoning is the understatement of the day. But, but when we think about suicide prevention education and technology, um, we're seeing a lot of new, new contributions from a technological perspective as it relates to how we deliver suicide prevention education. When we do this, especially for adult audiences, we, we always ask a couple of questions to begin with to punctuate a point I'll make in a minute. But I want to give you something to think about as we move through this, the next few slides. Where were you? When did you experience and how did you learn about, say, drinking, smoking, sex ed? What about mental health or substance misuse? Again, where, when, how did you learn about these things? Where, when, how did you learn about suicide, suicide prevention? 
I don't ask this to be silly. I ask this to punctuate the point that our children today, the youth today, are learning these things a lot earlier than, say, you and I did. The vast majority of this adult population didn't learn about these things until much later in life. And to make that point, I want to share with, a, with you a quick video. Why am I so nervous all the time? Why can't I sleep? Wish I could never wake up. I feel like I have all this weight in my chest. I wish I could just drop dead like my Uncle Hector. If you're worried about a friend that they might hurt themselves, I think you have to share that. If you're really worried about somebody, then you're actually being a good friend by telling someone and asking for help. Some of the warning signs for suicide um, can be changes in our sleep patterns. So sleeping a lot more or sleeping a lot less than we used to. Um, feeling really angry or irritable most of the time, as well as just feelings of hopelessness. If one of my friends who were really active on social media, but they just suddenly disappeared, I would get really worried. Please promise me you won't say anything to the nurse, Mr. Lepore, or anyone else. Promise? No, I can't promise that. If I was hurting the way you're hurting right now, you'd make sure I got help, whether I wanted to or not. Depression is treatable, and people can get better if they get help. She ended up going to therapy, and that helped her a lot. There's no shame in getting help, yeah. ever. So our mission, specifically tied to signs of suicide, is to prevent suicide. And we do it by nurturing help-seeking behavior, by teaching youth how to recognize, how to recognize the signs of depression and suicide, and more importantly, how to act. I want to give you a little background before I really get into what uh, what I'm really here to discuss, and that's the digital transformation of this program. But importantly through three randomized clinical trials, we've been able to demonstrate a 64% reduction in self-reported suicide attempts. It was originally designed for sixth to 12th grade um, students to recognize, again, uh, the signs of depression, suicide in themselves or in their peers. We're in about 17 countries. The program has been deployed uh, across the globe and we reach about 2 million students annually. And finally, we're awfully proud of this. 90% of our schools do report an increase in help seeking, help giving behavior. Recognizing the signs back to act is our technique. Acknowledge, care, tell. Acknowledge that uh, you're experiencing signs in your friend. Express that you care for your friend and then tell a trusted adult. But what I'm really here to talk about the program is really important, but what I'm really here to talk about is this technology-enabled advancement. And I think what's what was unique for us was the fact that under no circumstances could we, would we compromise the content? Would we, could we compromise the integrity of the research behind the content? Just to give you an idea of where we were three years ago, we were deploying SOS via DVDs and cardboard boxes. And through streaming video, we were able to produce, create a digital subscription model that allowed us to better track the asset, version control, uh, and more importantly, make it a little easier for our schools, districts across the globe to access the content. With the pandemic came our need to implement a very new modality. While we had already roadmapped a virtual delivery, a virtual modality of SOS, it certainly hastened the development and we've been really, really proud of the results through our virtual delivery. Uh, again, that being virtual into schools, into community centers, into homes. And I'll talk a little bit more about the research behind that in a minute. We're currently engaged Fable Vision and Nationwide Children's Hospital out of Columbus, Ohio, to help build multimedia storytelling uh, through some gamification 
This is a huge effort for us. It will necessitate a new round of research, uh, a program we're calling Little Acts for elementary school students. Again, pulling on the evidence of SOS, but recognizing the need to stand up a whole new round of research for that particular population, that age group. We continue to develop our self-directed interactive courses, something we call MindWise on Campus. Easy enough, right? Easy enough to say we've got to develop new content, but recognize an entirely new set of technologies, content development tools, deployment tools, et cetera. So again, this transformation, our digital transformation from cardboard boxes three years ago to where we are today, um, remarkable. And Monica, back to what you said, it is all about re-engineering the processes, your delivery mechanisms for products and or services. And finally, as we extend SOS, as we extend our suicide prevention efforts into the workplace, we've also ran a few pilots with, uh, with a company, a partner out called Mersion. Um, and this is avatar AI based role playing and practice. This provides very safe environments for adults to practice certain conversations, to experience things that they have experienced in the workplace, just haven't had the time to practice uh, the, the conversations needed to, to uh, address what's happening in the workplace. So how do we really focus on our direct to youth? How do we pull on the research we continue to do? There are a couple of recurring themes, many of which we've already heard today. Virtual delivery, more than half our students really, really, really encourage us to continue deploying more and more virtual assets. It's interesting because what it highlights for us are those safe spaces. We've known this for a while, but we can't assume that schools are safe spaces for our students, for our youth. So what does that mean? And how do we reach our youth where they are, be it their home, be it the YMCA, be it their church, their community centers? How do we get content and programming to them when they need it, where they need it? Trusted adults, core, core to SOS, tell a trusted adult. How do we continue to make certain trusted adults are trained up and comfortable with SOS suicide prevention content? Here it is. This is a theme we've heard three or four times today, the digital divide, that inconsistent infrastructure so the word I used earlier, versioning, I meant that word. I meant what I, what's behind that word. But there are school districts across our own country that struggle to stream video. There are, I think Monica, it was your example. There are families that don't have Wi-Fi that congregate in parking lots. That's what's been the most revealing, if not the saddest experience for us in MindWise over the last two years. So that digital divide, while it's a huge problem and we will do our best to solve for it. It's not, that's, we're gonna to have to figure this one out together. And then finally, fear. We continue to bump into fear. Fear steeped in myths around suicide prevention. Uh, fear steeped due to unsafe language promulgated by the media. It goes back to my somewhat silly question to all of you earlier. When did you learn about this stuff? The fact that our youth, our children are learning about and have access to suicide prevention content is by nature destigmatizing the content. They're entering the workforce ready for these conversations. So what is our role to continue to destigmatize and promote that education early on? Recognizing that the further upstream we go, the more research is needed. And to that point, direct to youth, how do we meet them where they are? Some of our continued efforts, trusted sources or trusted channels for distribution. We can't do it alone. And we need to make certain that those distribution mechanisms, those channels are trusted. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, we know all about this. Uh, while that's not our expertise, we do pull on that research often and are Awfully, awfully curious to see where it takes us, specifically around risk detention detection. We partner with a company called GoGuardian that has technology that helps kind of screen, assess student use of laptops. And 
promoting SOS content as a result of what they're finding on those laptops. Thirdly, continued research upstream, the work we're doing with Nationwide Children's Hospital, Fable Vision. Again, we've got a lot to figure out. It's a very different conversation at that age group, but a much needed conversation. And then continuing to develop our safe, self-directed content. There's an appetite, unlike I've ever seen, for highly engaging um, self-directed content for all ages. That said, thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. And Bruce, back to you. Thanks very much, Brian, for that very thoughtful and thought-provoking um, presentation on a, a concern to all of us that have kids and grandkids like me all over the, all over the country. So great stuff. Our last presenter in this panel is Dror Zaid, and I've known Dror for about a year or so. Um, he uh, came to us from the MIT Media Lab, I believe, and um, but he has a very unusual background. He's the co-founder and chief operating officer of Elios Health, which is a, be health, a behavioral health voice artificial intelligence system, uh, and it's a company that's pioneering a new workforce solution that drives operational and clinical efficiency for, for behavioral health providers. Before Elias Health, Dror served as a drone pilot in the Israeli Air Force for 13 years, where he rose to the, through the ranks and retired as captain. But during his service, he witnessed a lot of his soldiers struggling with mental health issues, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. And that inspired him to initially get into the first PT SD workshop for drone pilots and launched him in this direction. Um, so they have a really interesting platform in which artificial intelligence listens in on clinical therapeutic sessions and can help determine whether or not the clinician is on script or not. And uh, with that minimal introduction, I'm going inter to introduce you to Dror, who's going to talk to you about a fascinating new development in artificial intelligence adapted for clinical therapy. Dror, you're on. Thank you so much, Bruce, for uh, um, having me here. Thank you, uh, Vincent, Sarah, and the team. Uh, also, uh, um, hello, Monica, and thank you, uh, Trina, Audrey, Jason, and Brian for your fascinating presentations. My name is Dror, as uh, Bruce shared, and I'm going to share with you what we do at Elios Health. Um, hope that it, we can, uh, um, you know, spark some uh, uh, inspiration of about what what the future brings to this uh, um, to our space. So um, I'm one of the co-founders and chief operating of, of Elios. It's the first care ops automation platform. And when we say care ops, we mean more care, less ops. When we say ops, it's the operation, the administration, and the documentation that stands in the way of clinicians to actually do what they signed up for, which is providing care and spending time with people. What I, would like, what I would like us to do is to put ourselves in the seat of a clinician. Um, and together, this is Jason. He came for us to help him overcome his uh, mental health uh, uh, challenge. He, you know, he considered a lot of time to uh, um, whether he should reach out or not. Finally, he took the decision to reach out, waited for his session. And today, we have a 10 a.m. session with Jason. And as you know, Jason has a unique personality. He has a unique mental health challenge that he wants our help to overcome. And he has a, a unique background history and other treatments that he, he went through. And we want to help Jason. We want to be fully attentive um, to Jason when we, we want to help him. We want to be actively listening. We want to be present with Jason. And this is how one session looks like. This is how one day as a clinician for us looks like. We need to help nine different people with nine different mental health challenges nine different backgrounds and personalities, and we want to help all of them. Today, this is how our week will look like. In a week, we will help around 30 different people with 30 different mental health complex challenges, 30 different personalities and 30 different backgrounds. Now, it's not only being there, being present, listening and thinking about how we can help. It's also documenting everything that we do, emails, phone calls, consultations. And as you can imagine, because we're human and humans are essential for solving these types of mental health uh, um, challenges, we just can't remember what happens with every one of the people that we meet. And also this creates a huge burden on us, also from an administrative perspective, but also a cognitive and a mental 
uh, burden just to treat everyone. The reality of this is that people are not getting better. And unfortunately, if you look up on, on what clients are reporting post-treatment, is that only 30% of them are reporting any kind of improvement. If you um, Google, what are the success rates of heart transplants? They're above the 90%. If you'll Google what happens to people that are diagnosed with cancer on early stages, you'll see that more than 80% of people get better within after a year. But in behavioral health, something is not working. And how could that be? Because we know that in the academic setting, we have evidence-based techniques that are research-based, like CBT, like MI, that were also mentioned today. And we know that they work. So what happens when it gets to the field? And what happens is that clinicians today, they're trying their best, but they lack the tools to actually provide those therapies in the field. And what happens with that is that we have a decreased quality of life for all the people that we're trying to help. And those rare, unique sessions that they thought if they should go and seek for help, they finally took the decision, they waited for their, for their time, and now they're here. Those are not effective enough. Again, quality of life is decreased. And then of course, workforce uh, um, uh, suffers because of productivity loss um, and overutilization of uh, uh, healthcare services. If that's not enough, then we had COVID. And if we look at COVID as, a, as an earthquake, then the demand for behavioral health services is the tsunami that follows. And another thing that happened uh, during COVID is that not only more and more people are seeking for help, for, for help but also payers and state are increasing the requirements for documentation on clinicians, making the work even harder. When we speak with providers across the country, we see that 20% of clinicians' time, that is one day a week, is spent on documentation. 40% um, of them are turning over. Um, I've seen turnover rates up to 60%, uh, the highest organization that I've met with. There is inconsistent quality of care. We can't demonstrate that we're using evidence-based techniques that are used. We don't know to what extent are we using them, and we don't know what's working for who. And that leads to the huge lack of access to care and the shortage of 4.5 million clinicians by 2025. Now, I am not a very pessimistic, pessimistic uh, person. There is a solution, and this is what we're here to talk about uh, um, today. And before I'll explain exactly what we do, I want to, um, to share a word about what are our options when we come to treat people. Uh, um, and basically today we have two things that we know that are working. One is to provide them with talk therapy, as you can see on the picture on the right. And then we can also provide treatment with assisted medication or prescribe them also, it's something like digital therapeutics that is not here on the slide. Now, not like the treatment that is um, with medications, where we know what types of medications work for what types of uh, conditions, what is the dosage of the, of the pills um, that we need to take, what are the ingredients in those pills, what is the chemistry with, between them. In talk therapy, we seem to lack that information. We still don't know what types of modalities and within those modalities, what types of interventions are working for certain people and for certain conditions to that same extent? And then how can we take a therapy session and put it under the microscope like we do with a medication and understand what are the active ingredients in that session? So in the past couple of years, there was a huge uh, um, jump in uh, the natural language understanding uh, abilities in technology. And actually today it is possible to take a session and to have kind of like a finger, fingerprint to take that session and to identify the modality that is being used. And in that modality to take and identify the building blocks that consist of that modality. So here on the bottom, you can see a timeline or a, of a 45 minute session with different building blocks like a mood check and, uh, and a validation. And those building blocks will also include the emotions that are being shared, important highlights and quotes, interventions, and also the individual response for those interventions. When you take a look on those fingerprints of the session, what happens in the room, and then you compare it to the outcomes, self-report questionnaires and other outcomes that are after the room, you can start to understand 
what is working for who. And this is what we're doing at Elios Health. Um, we are pioneers in this world that take artificial intelligence in the intersection of behavioral health, and we help clinicians understand what is working for who. We identify best practices between clinicians. We highlight the evidence-based techniques that are using that drives outcomes, and we have recommendations for them that show that when they're doing something that is not leading to a, a good outcome, we let them know, and I'll show it in a minute. But then again, I was talking about, you know, the burnout. The fact that I'm now adding another tool for clinicians. There is, there is not one clinician in, in, in the universe that wants to deal with another tool. So how can we help clinicians? What interventions can we put into their workflow without creating more job for them? So the other cool part that Elios does um, for clinicians is that actually we create a suggested baseline progress note based on a specific encounter that you just had with your client that is that awaits for the, cl the clinician inside their EHR, inside the rubrics of their EHR with um, um, the suggested uh, um, interventions that they used with the quotes. And this way we shave off 40% of their documentation time. So instead of starting their notes from scratch, a clinician doesn't need to do the same repetitive actions that they need to do every day, 20% of their time. They can just focus on their clients um, and be fully attentive when they meet them. I'm going to now share my screen um, and hopefully share a quick demo of what we do with you. This is Elios. I'm now inside my EHR. One thing that we do is that we integrate the um, telehealth solution that you're using into your EHR. And um, what I'm about to do is I just finished my, finished my session and now I'm inside the EHR. And the first thing that you can see is that Elios identifies the length of the session. It identifies that it was a telehealth session. Any outcomes that we sent out as measurement-based care to the client are integrated into the um, EHR. But the coolest part, as I said, is that right after the session, you will receive a baseline for your progress note that shaves off 40% of your documentation time and saves the clinician's time, but not also time, also the um, cognitive load of being thinking on what I should document, what should I remember, I won't remember, I have to write it down. So all of those things they can let go of, they can be present in their sessions and can just enjoy helping people. Now to understand how we got from a session to this, uh, um, I'm gonna click here. This is going to take a couple of seconds to load here. And this will explain kind of like the abilities of the system um, when it comes to the insights that we show from the session itself. So what you can see here, this is a session. This is an analysis of a session. We can uh, um, play that session. Hi, Ali. How are you? We can see the video, hear the audio, see the transcript. On the left, we can see proximetics for the, for the for proximetics for the therapeutic alliance. Did we listen to our client and to what extent? We can see that this is within recommended range. Did we wait before we respond, what we call patients? For how long are we speaking when we are clinicians and for how long our clients are speaking when they are talking? We can leave comments to ourselves or if we have a clinical supervisor, they can provide us with feedback. We can see the interactivity between the speakers, who talked when, and we can see the building blocks that I was talking about, which evidence-based techniques, building blocks we were, talk we were using. Did they use reflective listening, et cetera. Below, we can see the themes of conditions. What do our clients talk about? We have anxiety, depression, substance use, trauma, eating disorder, relationship, homicidal, suicidal ideations, and more. The system also provides us with keywords that were emotionally charged or very frequent. I can click on a keyword like stress and then click play. Like that's another thing I'm worried about is the stress. I know they have high expectations, so I think I'm just stressed about that as well. And I can also look uh, for a specific word in the search bar and then find it 
and choose a moment that it was mentioned and play that moment too. And then, which would be to not worry and just take the exam. There's a lot more to Elios uh, than this, but we do have a uh, um, short time and I, uh, I'll try to get back now to my presentation. Um, and then all the technology that we have at Elios is um, developed in-house. There is uh, um, an extreme importance to be domain specific. You cannot utilize uh, any open, open source tools out there like cell calls, engines, and things like that, because you need to have domain specific information. You have to train the AI uh, engine on only therapy conversations. Another thing that Elios does is that it wasn't trained in an academic setting. We talked about the fact that we have, you know, clinicians that learned um, some kind of models or evidence-based models in an academic setting, and now they need to apply them in the field. So the Elios AI engines was, was trained only in real world conversations, meaning in real field conversations with real clients, not in an academic setting. Um, the last thing that I say is there is one thing that Elios system doesn't do, and it does not replace clinicians. We see humans as the center of the solution for these types of uh, mental health uh, challenges that people want to overcome. And then the one thing that we do is that we empower clinicians with reduction of documentation time by 40% and also insights of what evidence-based techniques they were using so they can get better, focus on people, and provide the, be the best care that they can as clinicians. This is a short list of uh, the organizations that are using care of automation uh, now in the US. Um, and I know this is not something that uh, everyone is used to see every day. I know that this uh, ignites important conversations about privacy and compliance. I'll just say that Elias is a HIPAA compliant tool that is being used after the client's consent. And I'll be happy to answer questions uh, um, now as part of the panel that we have, or you have my email here, and I'd love to have a conversation. Thank you for having me. Jor, thank you for a really thought-provoking and, uh, and wonderful presentation. Well done. And, and now I'm going to turn this over to Monica Oz, who is going to be our moderator to talk with this uh, panel and ask questions. And um, welcome again, Monica. Great. Well, I was, um, you know, what a day. We've had nine really very fascinating presentations it reminds me a bit of the blind man and the elephant, you know, a many different views, many different views of the same problem. But I do have a number of questions and I would encourage our audience to uh, ask questions as well. Um, I, I guess my one of my first questions is for Audrey and Jason, um, both looking at Mightier and looking at the uh, pair, pair solution. Um, the question I keep coming back to is kind of what's the role of the provider organization, the clinical professional there? How how do they integrate this both in clinical process, but also in payment? Well, I'm happy to I'm happy to start off with that question, and I I Great. love this question because um, it's very important to understand that uh, what we've created are tools to help clinicians and help patients, but Really, this is a tool that clinicians can use and integrate into their standard of care practice uh, in a way that really works for them. So there's, there's no directive from the device that tells clinicians that they have to use this at a certain cadence, they have to uh, do, you know, they have, it doesn't require them to have additional burden on their workload if they don't wish to use it. They don't even have to use it at all, the, the dashboard that is. It's there to help them. And uh, for those of us in, a, in the addiction treatment arena, we really have not had many tools in our toolbox and we've had very little data available to us. So it does give a great insight into what's going on with your patient and it can be very helpful. Yet at the same time, it doesn't mandate anything. There is the ability to enter uh, urine drug screen information when patients come into the clinic and 
that's great for patients because if it's an appropriate result, they get an extra spin of the contingency management rewards wheel. So they are rewarded for doing a, a good job with their drug screens, but clinicians don't even have to use that if they don't want to. So it's there for them to use and there's, there's a lot of capability, but it really doesn't add to their workload. And it, it isn't a device that can be used without a clinician. It has to be prescribed. And um, so it encourages patients to engage more into that therapeutic relationship. Thanks. Uh, uh, Jason, how about, how about you and Mightier? Where does this fit in the clinical workflow and reimbursement and the whole process? They're, they're both great questions. And I think from our perspective, we're still learning a lot. We interact a lot with families at their first interaction with the behavioral health system. So I think, I mean, I think most of the people on the call are going to be familiar with this, but this idea that a lot of families start their, their mental health journey through a pediatrician and then go on to a wait list or in search of care and really are looking for tools in that moment that can be consumer led and are still in evidence based. I think that one of the places where data is emerging is but not just even data is how we can interact with the reimbursement system in that moment of time. And we've, we've been fortunate. We've had a lot of good conversations with payers who are looking for ways to extend their program, either in partnership with employers or in partnerships with their own programs, because they know this gap is there. And they know that it, I think there's a building sense in the field that early intervention is so highly valuable to the payer. Um, and so we see that building over time, but field is, at least from our perspective, the field is still learning how that all works. Great, thanks. I also have a question for Brian about the SOS program and moving the virtual platform to schools. And it's a two part question. Uh, one piece is how have you, as you move from the, the physical presence to virtual, what are your tricks and success stories for getting engagement with the students through, I'm assuming the proxies of school administrators, teachers, and others. And my other question is a very direct one. Um, we work with a lot of organizations that use schools as a location for delivering mental health services. How do, how do you how does your program interface with them? Great, Monica, pleasure uh, pleasure to meet you. Uh, the first question around engagement virtually. There are components in the course itself that's very, very interactive. Um, this is, it's never easy when promoting SOS in a school or a school district. A lot of it is dependent upon where the school is, where the district is, and how open-minded they are to suicide prevention education. Once we're through over that hurdle, then it's a matter of whether it's face-to-face, -face, that is our, in classroom session or virtual. And again, the virtual is very, very interactive uh, through polling, things of, the, things of that nature. The second question around just engagements within schools, it, it kind of comes a, different, a couple of different ways. One, there's our, there are scholarship models that we, um, we have for schools, for districts. There are company sponsored licenses for schools. And then finally, foundations, um, nonprofits that will fund, sponsor uh, suicide prevention training in those schools. Hmm. Thanks. Well, then I have a question for Drawer from Bruce, and I'm going to add my, uh, my, my question for Drawer on top of it. Uh, Bruce's question was, have you had any of the therapist training programs uh, use your system to train therapists around EBPs? And my related question to that from your presentation is, can you, can you talk about how the feedback loop works? If I'm a therapist, am I getting feedback about my use of EVPs during the session, following the session? Is it a composite of an entire month's worth of work? Uh, perhaps you could address uh, kind of those two questions. Thank you, Bruce and Monica for the question. Um, yes, Elios has been used for training clinicians across uh, the country. Uh, it's a very common uh, uh, use of the platform. Um, we do not provide feedback for clinicians at time of session. We don't want to uh, um, be too intrusive with what happens in the room, and we want them to focus on the client as much as possible. Right after the session, the analysis is ready. Um, and they will be able to view, um, like I showed in the product, like 
if they listen within recommended range, etc. Another thing that they can do is they can leave um, bookmarks for um, themselves, like comments that are time-based that they can come back to and, for example, ask their supervisor for uh, feedback or ask the client for uh, uh, for something if they want in the next session. And if I'm a clinical supervisor, I can always leave a comment for my supervisee in a specific place that says, um, uh, Monica, this was a, a great intervention, or uh, try to ask this as an open-ended question in the next time you, uh, you meet with this client. Um, it takes um, seconds to understand how you did in a session when it comes to the feedback. Um, and, and then it's ongoing work and like being very, uh, you know, disciplined to the feedback and like being open to receive the feedback and learning from the tool. And the cool thing about Elios is that it's objective feedback. So it's not a subjective or memory based that someone remembers of what happened. This is what happened in the session. This is what you said at this time. This is how you act. This is how you said things. And as clinicians, we always ask our clients to be flexible, to work on themselves, to show, to do changes when it comes to their cognitive behavioral changes. I also think that there is a room for clinicians to show some flexibility and to learn and to get better because I know that they want and, and they are um, accountable for providing the best care there is. Mm. Thanks. Um, I, I did want to pivot. We have a question about access to digital therapeutics. And so this may be a great question for both Audrey and for Jason. Um, you know, how do you, do you have advice for consumers or families who want to advocate for the health plans to give access to either the Reset product or to Mightier. Um, what have you done in the past working with advocacy groups? And we're hoping you could share a little bit of your experiences in, in that kind of health plan advocacy. Yeah, I can start. I think that, you know, for this, I think access to has, has a lot of layers. And I think that you know, for, for a lot of health plans, there are processes where an individual consumer can find, you know, through various mechanisms, can find places where they can, where they can advocate for themselves through, uh, through various channels. And I, the ex specific experiences we've had with MyDear have been relatively, um, have been relatively promising. I think that the, the piece that an individual consumer, at least for us, and I, you know, can say is that when Consumer, it's when consumers reach out to the product itself. So, be it my, I don't want to speak for pair, but if they reach out to us, like there are multiple, you know, I mean, I think again, there are multiple layers to interacting with, especially with a payer. And I think being able for us to be able to package up the messages that we hear from consumers um, is really valuable. I think the other piece that, I mean, I would ask the other panelists, but I don't know. I don't know if an industry group has emerged under which all of us can like interact with payers at the, you know, and sort of like a one voice advocating for, for these types of interventions. And I think like that type of coordination is going to need to emerge in order, because this is a change for the field. This idea that you would put digital as a first step um, along a journey, it, it, it is a change. Um, I think Trina talked about this quite well. and. I think it's going to take uh, it's going to take some coordinated movement and not just any one of us acting alone. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback I mean, on that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a tremendous amount to unpack with that question. You know, having introduced a brand new modality in 2019, uh, we quickly realized that, as some of the speakers this morning were saying, it's great to have these amazing new tools, but they're not that useful if people can't prescribe them and use them. So a lot of our effort over the last couple of years has been trying to help create the infrastructure that's necessary to integrate digital therapeutics into our current health care system, a system that we would probably all agree is not a system that anyone would ever design if they were starting from scratch. So, you know, we've really had to take a yeah, we've really had to take an approach where we're coming at it from all all angles. Uh, as far as working with advocacy organizations, we work with all kinds of professional uh, organizations, uh, ASAM, AMA, the Shatterproof. We have uh, 
alliances with many of them. There also is um, a national organization, the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, and, and that came up uh, this morning that represents all of uh, digital behavioral health, not just prescription digital therapeutics. And they, they've been very instrumental in uh, working on guidelines. They just published a, an outline for helping uh, payers and uh, users to understand how to evaluate different forms of behavioral treatments. So that's going to be very useful. Um, and just working on uh, local, state, federal legislation uh, to help create the kinds of uh, infrastructure that we need. So for example, the HICPIC codes that were just announced, you know, that was quite an effort to get those, but without uh, reimbursement codes, you know, it's not practical for clinicians to be able to use these. So we have those now. Um, so we're identifying and, you know, working on all of these different issues. And there is a lot of momentum. Things are happening very quickly. So the pieces are falling into place. And, you know, as other companies and other therapeutics come along, it's it's going to get easier as time goes by. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of work and uh, happy to report we're having quite a bit of success. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, I, I have a question. There's a question from the audience and a, for drawer that parallels a question that I have. Um, and the question is, as a clinician myself, I am intrigued to learn more about the care ops automation. Uh, the question is regard to notes and how they are constructed. Can you talk about how the documentation written with the automation um, will be unique to each individual client and not be generic or cookie cutter? And, and my follow on question to that is, I know a number of the provider organizations that we're working with are hesitant to adopt this type of AI technology. They're worried about not passing audits for the same reason. So perhaps you can you know, give us a, a little short course on how that works and some of the you know, response to some of the concerns. Sure, I think it's a very valid point. Um, so in a 45 minute uh, session, there are between 6,000 to 7,000 words that are being said. And in, a, in, a, in an average progress note, there are around 300 words that need to be distilled into that note. Now, the way that Elios works and is that we customize every note to the rubrics and the clinical guidelines of every organization that we work with. And we also take into consideration any compliance requirements that they have from the state or the payers that they work with. Now, the note that the Elios uh, engine creates has unique quotes from that specific session, so it cannot be a cookie cutter. Um, it also identifies evidence-based techniques that were, used, that were used by the clinician, and we will put it there. If you think about what are the quality of notes that are being created today, then not all uh, writers of notes are uniform. There are clinicians who write very lengthy words and they see their documentation as kind of like an art. And there are clinicians that unfortunately copy paste um, templates from a Word document and put them in the EHR and they don't uh, put a lot of effort in their, in their notes, mainly because they're back-to-back -back sessions and they don't have the time to even go to a, 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 you know, a bio break if they need to. So this is what we have. Now, Elios, as I said in the presentation, it does not replace the clinician. We see the human as a, as a crucial part of the documentation too. And we suggest a template that has specific information from that encounter for their edit and confirmation. So instead of writing my notes from scratch and the parts that are repetitive, like this writer met with the client today and used X, Y, Z. I now get the generic parts randomized with different libraries of sentences that we have and specific quotes that I don't need to remember how they, you know, mentioned something. I can sift through different quotes um, and choose and, and, and pick what I would like to bring into the note. In addition, Elias also has sug suggestions that are, as I said, linked to the compliance requirements. For example, if you would like to remember to mention the goals that are mentioned in the treatment plan, or the presenting problems that are mentioned in the, in the treatment plan and bring them into the documentation, or if you like to um, use the right language. For example, if I will say I rode on the bus with the client or I offer transportation or any kind of wording, 
with using clients' names or referring to them as clients, not in, in their in their um, first names, etc., etc., etc. So I hope this helps to explain how it is not a cookie cutter and how it does it helps clinicians to write actually notes that are far more richer with medical necessity than what we as humans can remember. Well, I think that's a great explanation. I do think that um, I, there probably is a need for education of the regulators around that, because I, I think there there's both uh, concern on the part of providers and I think a mis a misunderstanding on the part of regulators about how AI can actually improve the quality of notes and not so much act like a cookie cutter. So that, that was a great explanation and one I'm gonna to carry to my own clients. Now, I, I did have a, a question unique to Jason and Brian, and that is both of you are operating in the, you know, children's mental health arena. You know, we've heard most of the sessions today over the time have really focused on adults. Uh, I was hoping maybe that each of you could share a bit about what do you think is what has been your experience about what is unique about effective communication to the youth market in mental health? And could you share something you've done that has not worked? How much time do you have? I can share lots of things that haven't worked. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that when we talk about children, I mean, one of the things that I do like that we've done from the very beginning is that We've tried to package up the technology in a way that builds up around, it builds up mechanisms that we know about, but it packages them and reframes them in a way that is uniquely possible for by technology. And it it leans into like the space the space where developmentally children are in. So I think in the developmental psychologist by training, and there's there is a lot of work around, you know, how children learn through exploration, how children learn through a discovery, and how children really, I mean, how children build up their sense of the world around them. And I think a core part of what we've always done is try to make the idea of emotional regulation discoverable and playful, which, which is, which is, it's just different than a talk based approach. And like the metaphor that we've always used is this idea of riding a bike. Um, no one could throw a manual at you and you could come out the other end riding a bike. Um, but in a lot of children's therapies, especially evidence based therapies, that's, that's kind of the process we take. And when we've got kids who are so willing to explore and engage and play, being able to take advantage of that and being able to take advantage of that instinct and turn that into an intervention, I find very powerful. Um, the flip side of that is that when you go into that space, um, you there's there's a lot of need to actually like you have to engage children. And I think especially in that space, there's I, mean, I don't know. I mean, we have a we have a long list of, of, of failures and adventures, and like, I mean, you know, I, I I I think we all have to subscribe to the growth mindset model. So, like, but like, what is actually going to be fun? What is actually going to be engaging? Like, we we went into this model and we found this model where we bring in content that's not ours, and that turned out working out working out really really well for us. Um, but we didn't start there, and we've built things that, I mean, honestly, like we watch retention curves just fall off a cliff if we don't do things like that, because it's really hard to be fun with a child. Um, and I think especially when you're coming from an academic and a scientific background, it, you, you just got to start with the assumption that you're not a fun person. Um, I'm sorry to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, Brian, how about, how about you? What have you? What have you learned that's unique and what hasn't worked? I'm sorry, Jason. Well, well said, and I, I agree. I, yeah. I think um, yeah. simply stated, it has to be their stories. It has to be their stories and their voice. Um, I think we've done a really, really good job of capturing, um, again, their stories in a very, very safe, safe way using safe language. What hasn't gone well? Um, well, the expression I often use with the team is us talking to ourselves. Jason, I think maybe that's something you use in, as well. This isn't about us talking to ourselves. This isn't what we think is right. This isn't what we think is best. Take, for example, a 20 minute video for a sixth grader or seventh grader, not going to work. So listening to them, hearing their stories, capturing their stories, and then using the appropriate technologies. Um, Trina, was it you that referenced TikTok earlier? 
Um, it's yeah. using their technologies, using what they and how, where they go and how they engage each other. Um, seems like common sense, but easier said than done. But I think to leverage, because what you talked about, like you're partnering with people who speak the same language, like like your partnership with Fable Vision, right? Like there are experts in this in this field where we can, as we bring them in, like we don't have to have all the answers and right. bringing kids to the forefront and then using those experts, using experts who are making media that can connect and resonate and these experts who are great at talking with children and building experiences they have meeting, like I feel like that's key too. Like I'm not trying to hold all the burden up yourself. And, and Jason, that's I, good advice for yeah. anyone looking at kind of a moving in applying digital to children's services. Thank you. Yeah. Now there was a question for Audrey about the pair development pipeline that you mentioned. Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about what you see coming next at pair? You know, anxiety or depression or psychotic disorders, and how will that be similar or different to the uh, kind of reset and reset O approach? Yeah, um, well, I had mentioned during my talk that we are interested in developing a product for specifically for alcohol use disorder. Um, Reset is currently authorized for alcohol plus another substance, but especially during the pandemic, the uh, use of uh, alcohol really became much more noticeable and much more problematic for many, many people. And it continues to be the number one substance that uh, is un overused and is uh, really a risk to people's health. So uh, we're focusing on that because we feel that the, that while reset is great for poly substance use, there are um, specific uh, approaches for people who use alcohol that would be more effective and uh, so we're working on that. And as well, we're interested in uh, major depressive disorder. Um, we are still a small company. So, you know, one of, one of our things is we like to move at what we call pair speed and get everything done as quickly as possible. But we do have to pace ourselves because, uh, you know, we have a, a development team and a, and a product team and uh, we're working on many tasks at the same time. So, you know, we have our vision and, and a perfect world of all the products we'd like to develop, but uh, we kind of have to, you know, not bite off more than we can chew at a time. So um, I would say major depressive disorder and alcohol use disorder are definitely uh, on our radar for the near nearer future. Ooh, great. Now, uh, one other question for Drawer that has come up, and there are a couple versions of this. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned um, integrating your, the platform that you have with EHRs and with uh, telehealth platforms. Uh, do you have particular partners you work with? Is your solution technology agnostic? Um, how would an organization that's working with you make sure that they could integrate, that the solution could integrate both with their EMR and their telehealth platform? Yes. Um, one, of the, um, one of the questions we get uh, asked all the time is uh, what about the HR integration? And uh, on this front, I have uh, um, some happy news. Um, Elios integrates with every web-based EHR. I will not name uh, specific companies um, because we are friends with everyone. Uh, but any web-based okay. service that you have, yeah, we don't play that 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 game. Um, any web-based EHR that you're working with that you can uh, wrap your uh, your minds around, we can integrate with. Um, as one of the uh, CIOs that I was with a call uh, on yesterday, he said that uh, it's like a miracle. And one thing that is about a miracle, it's that they're hard to believe. So I'm going to explain what is in the process. And it means that we do not need the EHR IT team to actually do anything in the process. Um, we need the IT team of the provider that wants to bring us in um, to do very simple four steps that is basically allowing us to have access and explaining what is the workflow that they want our, uh, our help with. And then it takes us between six to 12 weeks to customize the note and make sure that everything goes into the right place. This is about the EHR. Regarding the telehealth platform, 
We are fully compatible with Zoom. Uh, we actually have a unique integration with them and we have uh, an app on their marketplace, which is kind of like their app store. Um, we are compatible with Microsoft Teams too. Um, and other great players like Mend. And it takes us usually three months to do an integration with a telehealth uh, um, um, partner. Um, and again, what we'll need is an admin account on your telehealth platform and we will make all the work. Hmm. Great, thanks. Well, I know we're almost out of time, but there's one question that came in at the beginning that is a question about a specific, but it begs a broader answer about using digital 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 tools in the healthcare system. Um, and I want each of you as part of our closing to take a stab at, at answering this. Um, the question was, how do we protect patients from overprescribing like the DOJ's investigation into cerebral? I realize they have not been charged, but is it a concern? I, I think it's a very valid question, but I think it begs a bigger picture issue of, about regulation and oversight and compliance. And, and that is, you know, should the oversight and compliance of digital health tools be different and have different standards than the standards for face-to-face uh, -face practice? Um, and if so, how should it be the same or different? Um, you know, anyone care to take a, a stab at that? <laughs> it's a big picture question say, at the end of the day. Yeah, I'll I say think something. And you know, whoever posed this question was really visionary because we have so few digital health tools that can be prescribed. So the idea of them being over prescribed is really looking into the future when they're uh, ubiquitous and, and we use them a lot. And uh, just like every other healthcare modality, it will be the judgment of the physician or the prescriber to determine what is the best course of treatment for their patient. So, you know, if if over prescribing of digital health tools should become a problem, um, you know, this morning we were talking about the role of the FDA and are they the appropriate regulatory body to, for oversight for all of this. Mm -hmm. um, right now, they, they are the regulatory body that we have. Um, should digital health tools become uh, more integrated into our normal course of treatment, and, and there might be many more of them, you know, then at that point, as a society, we may wish to form some other type of regulatory oversight. Right now, we're just at the beginning stages of looking at protocols or guidelines for the use of digital health tools. So, you know, we're, it, we're really in a very early phase uh, you know, it's kind of like asking the Wright brothers about the formation of the Federal Aviation Authority. Uh, you know, we, we're we not really there yet, is what I would say. Okay. Well, Brian, what about you? Do you see the, you know, you, you've offered programming both in the face-to-face -face model, the virtual model. Do you see a need for different types of regulation and oversight of those different types of programs? When you first asked the question, I was I was reminded of the um, the article that you just wrote, and you know how you captured this idea of this the privacy paradox. There's a part of me that that wonders how privacy paradox is going to evolve over the next couple of years, and how that will influence regulation or not uh, in terms of say digital or virtual delivery. Um, I, d I don't. Monica, I don't know. I don't know right now where I where I stand on that, other than just watching what happens with privacy paradox over the next couple of years. Um, yeah. So privacy to you is probably the big difference, is what happens to the data? Yeah. 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 And Drawer, how about you? Any any thoughts about the differences in, you know, documentation using the standard paper and pencil and moving? to some kind of AI documentation, any need for additional oversight or different oversight? 
Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Of course, that I'm a little bit biased towards uh, using AI to uh, assist with the communication here. Um, but I'll say also about the privacy um, that, and about also the prescription of, you know, overutilization of, uh, of uh, digital therapeutics. I'll say this, we as humans do not like changes. It's hard for us to, uh, um, to make a change in everything, in our family life, and especially in our, in our day-to-day -day work. Um, and I think that we need to be a little bit more flexible towards changes because we have some misconceptions in our, in our minds. Um, I'll give one from the Elios uh, world that is easy for me. Um, privacy, recording of a session, right? It sounds like it's uh, uh, every clinician uh, moves in their seat and says, who, who the hell will agree to this, right? But the truth is that every clinician that was trained to become a clinical psychologist or a clinical social worker was actually providing recording, recordings of sessions with real clients after their consents, of course, when they were licensed to become supervisors. And then, is that recording necessarily a bad thing? I'll give an example. A lot of people ask me, what happens if I get uh, um, you know, subpoenaed to court with this information? And then I'll answer, what happens if I'll get subpoenaed into court today on a session? I have, let's say, a client. And let's say that she is in psychosis and depression. And after a session, she goes and sues me because of sexual harassment and there is no evidence of what happened in that room. The reality is that both sides feel very bad about the situation. The clinician might lose their license and they need to have uh, their word against the other person's world, word. And the client who is dealing with a mental challenge, they can say that they're not balanced and that they're claiming things that never happened. And now someone that is dealing with a mental challenge also needs to deal with the truth. How can I show the truth? And then in that case, a recording protects the client and protects the clinician. Because if you are providing the right treatment, then here is your insurance policy for that. And if you were hurt, then here is the evidence. So for me, and this is a change because we're not used to that. For me, the only thing that I want to take from this piece, which I know is a little bit blunt and a little bit like my hope, that sometimes a change is not necessarily bad. Sometimes there are two, or every time there is two sides for every coin. So to me, if a digital therapeutic becomes something that is overutilized and over uh, um, done, it's just like someone who um, got addicted to running and never stopped, and now they're injured in their legs. Because running is a good thing in general. Everything needs to come in the right quantity and into the mm -hmm. right people with the right doses. So this is my take uh, um, on that and on privacy, and on. Uh, um, I hope it helps. So you see it as a, you see the use of digital as potentially having, uh, offering additional protections, both for the clinician and for the practitioner as, as well. Definitely, definitely. And then Jason, I hear, oh, sorry, I, sorry, go I, ahead. I just, I have, I have uh, clients and we have customers that are, we, we don't have enough clinicians, right? 20% of their time they're doing the commentation. Sometimes in their life, there is a questionable event where, their licenses are put on hold because we want to see what happened in the room. And then they are sent to a different site and they're being questioned on like what happened, what happened in the room, et cetera, et cetera. We can save those days. We can solve those issues because 90% of our time or 99% of the time, our clinicians are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is helping people. They've done their work. They're doing the right work. And it's so easy to show that they're doing it. But we're educated that everything that happens in this room is a black box. And it's unshareable. Why? Hmm. Share it in the right yeah. pipelines. Share it in the right streams. That's it. Hmm. Well, thanks. Well, Jason, I'm going to leave the last words for you. Uh, any thoughts about you know kind of regula regulation of digital uh, apps like Mightier and how it should be different or the same than regulation of other kinds of therapy? It's a, it, like others have said, it's a big question and I'd be lying if I knew the right answer for us right now at this time. I think, you know, I think that there are certain standards and frameworks that we as a community absolutely need to be adopting right now. And I think, I mean, honestly, it starts with good science and I think we need to all be transparent about our good about science um, and showing that what we're doing is making the impact that we think it's making. Um, 
You know, beyond that, I Audrey's comment about the Wright brothers and the FAA resonates with me. I just, I think we don't know enough yet about how our tools are going to be used and what other tools are going to come onto the market um, to be able to make statements about what the right regulatory environment is. And, you know, we're in a position right now where, you know, I think you know, it's one of the things that's inspiring about days like this is that everyone is moving forward on this vision where, you know, like Dora was saying, like these technologies are going to be a net benefit on the whole. Um, and so we need to get there and then be able to go to that plateau and then be able to say, okay, what is the right regulatory environment to support this and to support our patients and our families and, and those we care about? Well, your comments remind me of the Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. If, the, if you know, we are, you know, I, I think a lot happening and, and you know, kind of with that, I, I'm just thinking about the totality of the day. Um, and I had, I, I think I had five or six big takeaways today. One was the continuous theme about health equity and particularly assuring that new digital health tools don't uh, perpetuate health inequities, I think is a top of mind issue as we move ahead. Um, I, I'm still thinking about the need of educating the field in general. I, I think there's a lot of confusion in the among both managers and clinical professionals in the health and human service field about the difference between a self-directed app, a piece of digital, a digital health solution that needs a coach, um, and one that is integrated into the treatment process. And I, I can see after the discussion today that that's a fundamental kind of educational issue, along with the whole concept of digital navigator, how do, you know, what is that? How do we codify what it is? How do we ensure reimbursement? Um, I've been working in the field quite a while and I've seen the evolution of peer support. And I, I think the trajectory will be very similar, which is both um, great that there is a trajectory and frustrating because it, it took quite a long time to move along that path. Um, I still think there are questions about the financially sustainable role for clinical professionals as this wide swath of digital health tools kind of moves from the bench and pilot programs to scale in the market. Um, and, and along with that, you know, the whole issue of scale, I'm, I'm still not quite sure. I mean, I mean the, the current performance in the healthcare field is that it takes 17 years for a scientifically validated intervention to reach half of the consumers for whom it is appropriate for. So somehow, some way, if we are going to speed along the revolution, we need to figure out how do we how do we have implementation, scalable implementation models that will really work? And then my, my last big question is really about the, on the payer side of things, both the payers and the health plans and ACOs who work for them is uh, trying to standardize what the payers are looking for in terms of economic impact data that would make them more likely to put their reimbursement muscle behind all of these many new solutions that we've just talked about today. But I, I know I, I, that those are just a few of the things that I thought were really, you know, really big discussion points today. Uh, Bruce, I want to uh, kind of turn over the program to you for your kind of closing thoughts and closing remarks. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, spend a day with um, a, a group of thought leaders and really explore what I think is the next steps in digital transformation.